All right. Uh, last time I mentioned that uh, we could use the formalism we developed for level crossings and apply it to the case of uh, dichotomous diffusion which has a finite velocity. So, let me show you explicitly how this is done and if you recall the problem is the following. Uh, it is level crossing in dichotomous So, recall what dichotomous diffusion looks like. Uh, we have a system which a uh, particle which is moving on the x axis with speed either plus c or minus with velocity plus c or minus c reversing direction randomly and then a typical thing if it starts for instance from the origin in the plus state in the plus c state goes up like that and then uh, reverses direction and keeps doing this kind of thing. Okay. And what we would like to find out is what the statistics of the crossing instance at which it crosses some threshold looks like. Okay. Uh, without much uh, for simplicity we could take the level to be 0 itself. This is the origin and this is a function of time. This is what the process looks like and here the slope is c and in this case the slope is minus c. And we want the statistics of this uh, crossing. In particular, we want to know what the average number of crossings is in a given time interval, 0 to capital T, say sufficiently long time interval. So, if you recall, the formula that we wrote down for this level crossing for the mean number was like this. We said the number of particles, uh, number of uh, crossings of some threshold, x threshold in say a time interval from 0 to t, this is what we computed, the average value of this was equal to an integral from 0 to t dt and then an integral over x dot over the velocity v. So, let us just call it v dv and then v dot was here. We wanted the number of total crossings namely up or down did not care about that. So, this was this be here and then after doing all the delta function integrals etc we ended up with the probability density of x v t in this fashion and this integral ran from minus infinity to infinity yeah. that was the general formula that we had now we want to apply this to the case at hand okay now we let's be specific about the case that we're talking about we're looking at a system where the particle starts with equal probability in the right moving or left moving state for which we wrote down an explicit solution and then we computed this number. We computed p left and p right separately and of course, you can see that uh, p of x v t is nothing but a delta function of uh, v minus c to show that it is the right moving state multiplied by p r of x t plus delta of v plus c p left of x and t. It is obvious that this is the correct expression because either the velocity is plus c or minus c this uh, v and therefore, in the plus state it was this was the probability density of the position in the minus state it was this in this fashion. All we got to do is to plug this in and do this integral right. So, this uh, quantity here once you plug it in we can do the integral by the way uh, not v dot v because x dot the same as v ok. This quantity is always c. So, it just comes out of the integral as you can see c times and then if you do this integration over v you pick up one from v minus c and v plus c. So, this guy here becomes uh, c times integral 0 to t dt 
and then all you have is P r of x t plus P l of x t which was the positional probability density itself C times integral of 0 to P d t P of x t in this fashion okay. And we wrote a solution down for this P of x and t and all we have to do is to plug it in and compute this integral right. Now if you recall the solution for this P of x and t was the following with initial conditions corresponding to half delta x in the r state, half delta x in the min l state and corresponding things for the time derivatives. This quantity p of x and t was equal to one half e to the minus nu t that is the reversal rate times delta of x minus c t plus delta of x plus c t in this fashion okay plus there was a nu over 2 c, there was an e to the minus nu t always and then nu over 2 c i naught of nu xi over c plus nu nu t over 2 xi i 1 of nu xi over c here where xi was equal to c squared t squared minus x squared square root that was the formula. Okay. Now when you want to apply that to level crossing we want to do this for crossings after for t greater than 0 within the interval 0 to t. So we want to compute it in this interval here this open interval which means that you do not want to include the end points 0 and t in particular you do not want to count this fellow as a crossing it starts at 0 okay. But you just look at this formula you realize that this is just the delta function with which things start and as a function of t this goes on. So this contribution is not to be included here for t greater than 0 this contribution is not included if you say the threshold is at x equal to 0. So let us compute the statistics of these points and so on in up to some capital T. Okay. So what we need to put in is this expression for P of x and t without this portion because that just corresponds to the initial delta function which spreads out and count it from here onwards. So let us put uh, without loss of generality. Uh, oh sorry there is also a threshold sorry this is all at threshold threshold t. So this is x threshold t, t. that is what we want to compute x threshold v and t. So let us look at uh, x threshold equal to 0. So we want crossings of the origin itself on the x axis. Now what happens to xi when x is 0? It becomes just ct out here. So you got an i naught of nu over c times ct which is i naught of nu t and you get a ct here and the nu cancels and again you get uh, the t cancels and you get nu over 2c. So what we need to write is this equal to c times an integral from 0 to t dt uh, nu over 2 c e to the minus nu t like so and then i naught. So what we have is n of 0, 0 t average this and then i naught of nu t plus and this also becomes the same thing i 1 of nu t and of course the c cancels and you get nu over 2. And 
distances. That is it. That is an exact formula for the number of average number of crossings of the origin of x equal to 0. And all you do have to do is to compute this integral. Okay. There is no approximation here. It is an exact formula as it stands. And you can compute this integral numerically. Okay. We would like to see what happens to it for t very, very large over a very long period of time. What is the number of uh, crossings of the order of? What is it going to be of the order of? How does it increase? What power of t does it increase like? that is the question of interest. That is not hard to answer because uh, you know that if t becomes very large, if the argument becomes very large, I know that uh, i j of any z goes like e to the power z divided by square root of 2 pi z as z tends to infinity. That is the leading behavior independent of what j is. So, in this integral, it is clear that when this becomes very large here, then the contribution comes from very large values of t, little t, but then that is when this becomes e to the new t with a plus sign that cancels against this and then you have the square root of 2 pi t, whatever it is. So, this tells you that in the leading behavior, the asymptotic behavior is given by uh, well, let us first let let us first do the following. Let us write this with nu t as the integration variable. Let us call that equal to u or something like that. Hmm. Then this becomes u e to the minus u. This nu goes away. So, you get a half. This becomes nu t up there and then this is i naught of u i 1 of u. So, in this form it is much more transparent. You want to see what happens when nu t becomes very large. So, the contribution comes from the fact that this guy here also goes like e to the u, but with a root 2 pi u in the denominator. right? So, this goes like 1 half and then there are 2 of these fellows. So, that is factor 2 goes away and then an integral up to nu t du e to the u is cancel and you get root 2 pi and then u to the minus half which is u to the half over half right. So, this becomes nu t to the half and there is another factor 2 up there. So, this is equal to square root of 2 nu t over pi. Okay. So, that is the leading behavior okay. and then there are corrections to it which will die off as capital T becomes infinite. Okay. You can easily check that the next correction here it comes from the asymptotic behavior of this. The next term will have a 1 over t to some power and that will not dominate. This is the dominant part. So, the sum and substance is that this quantity is proportional to square root of t for very, very large t. Okay. So, it is a non trivial statement that you have this particle going up and down on the x axis and it keeps reversing direction every now and then, but moves with the same speed all the time. Then you ask how often does it cross its starting point in a large time t on the average it crosses a Propose some a number times square root of t. One could now ask what is the variance of this? After all, this t is this number is a random variable, you could ask what is the variance of this thing. That requires you to find n squared first and then take the average. So, it will involve two integrals of this kind and it will involve a joint probability density p of x v t 1 p of x prime v prime t t 2 which also you can write down and go through the same argument as before. It turns out that in that case it turns out that n squared I am not going to prove this of 0 0 t goes like nu t minus twice the average value of n. 
this is not an obvious statement you have to actually work this out and it turns out it goes like this. Now, what will that imply? It will immediately imply that the standard deviation once you subtract out this fellow here you get the variance and you can see that in both cases both of them are going to go like square root of t. So, the ratio of the two is going to go to a constant of some kind the relative fluctuation is going to go to some constant as t becomes very large. So, that is an interesting property of this dichotomous diffusion and you can generalize this to various other cases etcetera. One immediate generalization of uh, this persistent diffusion or correlate dichotomous diffusion is the following. You could say well conceivably the rate of reversal when it goes from plus to minus c could be different from the rate of reversal from minus to plus c right. It is like having the integral of a dichotomous process in which the switching between the two different states occurs at different rates in general. So, you would have a sort of biased diffusion in that case the master equation will change that is a little more complicated, but you can solve that problem too you can again write down closed expressions and so on. So, this is a non trivial statistical property of this process. The other non trivial property is to ask what is the um, mean first passage time like what is the first passage time distribution like and so on. Namely you could say uh, on the x axis I start with the origin and there is some point x say and I would like to ask what is the distribution of the time of first passage through this point x. Now, it is clear that this can only happen for t greater than x over c because this thing is ballistic with a finite velocity ok. Given that the question is what is the time of mean uh, time of first passage what is the distribution of this time of first passage and how long does it take to do it. Now, in the case of ordinary diffusion just plain diffusion we know the answer we know that uh, in that case p of x t is uh, is equal to 1 over 4 pi d t to the half e to the minus x squared over 4 d t that was for ordinary diffusion plain diffusion. And then we also discovered that the distribution the probability density function in time which I call q in time to start at the origin and hit a point x for the first time this guy here was equal to for positive x or for negative x does not matter it was mod x over 4 pi d t cubed to the power half e to the minus x squared over 4 d t. This was a distribution Levy distribution with exponent half in time defined for positive values of t ok. Now, because for large t this goes like 1 over t to the 3 halves this follows harmless goes to unity it is clear from this that the mean time it takes to hit this point is infinite. That was a property of uh, normal diffusion that the mean time to hit a point x from the origin on either side the average time is infinite although the probability of hitting that point is 1 always. Now, you could ask what happens in the case of dichotomous diffusion. First of all I said that the time time distribution itself this fellow here would start being non zero only after greater t greater than mod x over c, but we are interested in the asymptotic behavior for long time what it does and so on. This can be solved because what you need now is to say what is the probability of the system being in this region to the left of this point x without being absorbed at the point x without having hit this point x. So, you have to solve the problem of persistent diffusion in the presence of an absorbing barrier with a suitable boundary condition. Now, once you do that and that is not very hard to do by the method of images for example, you would have a thing like if you have p with an absorber at x this would be equal to p without an absorber of x prime. Uh, so, if you ask what is this as a function of x prime t this is equal to p without an absorber x prime t well this is not the way to write it, but let, let me not get into this let me not write this out explicitly 
what you need to use is the method of images which is what we use for ordinary diffusion. I can write this as a difference of two p's by reflecting the point x prime on this mirror here. So, I would have a p of uh, x prime t minus p of 2 x minus x prime t ok. And this is guaranteed that when x equal to x, x prime hits the value of x you get 0 here things are absorbed here. So, we have to solve the diffusion problem on this left region use this solution in it and that tells me if I start from some point in this case the origin for example, it will tell me the survival probability here when I integrate and then minus the rate of change of that as a function of time is the q the rate of absorption here passage here. So, we can work this out now that we have an expression for p of x comma t. It is a little laborious, but this can be worked out and then you can ask what the mean time is. Now, what would you expect is the mean time? Would you expect it to be finite? Hmm? Why not? Well, that does not immediately imply that because the fact that there is an infinite amount of space here does not imply that the time it takes to hit that the mean time is infinite does not imply that at all because it depends on the other circumstances right. For instance, if I have a bias in that direction that is not true it will definitely hit it hmm? and in a finite time too. So, the fact that you need the fact that you have an infinite expanse to the left, but would you expect this uh, mean time in the case of dichotomous diffusion to be finite whereas, it was infinite for ordinary diffusion. Well, recall that this dichotomous diffusion in a suitable limit in the limit in which c tends to infinity and nu tends to infinity such that c squared over 2 nu tends to a finite value d goes over into ordinary diffusion. So, for sufficiently long times this behaves like ordinary diffusion because these delta functions will kill will die down the two delta functions at plus or minus c t die down exponentially and this envelope becomes a Gaussian finally we saw that explicitly last time right. So, at long times the process is ordinary diffusion essentially right? and if that has an infinite mean time so will this right? pretty much the same reason it is still infinite at this point. So, although recurrence of although the passage to any finite point x is definite the mean time to do so is infinite it certainly continues to be infinite, but it is a little more intricate to write down what the expression is for this q it is not it is not as simple as it is here it is not a Levy distribution or anything like that ok. So, this brings us to uh, a point where we can take off in two different directions one of them is to say all right this was an example of uh, the x process was an example of a non Markov process. This did not obey uh, the, the x is not a Markovian random variable because this uh, system remembers its velocity ok and it did not obey the ordinary diffusion equation. So, we can ask what are the further generalizations of these non Markovian processes what do non Markov uh, uh, processes if they are controlled by non Markov processes what does the diffusion look like what does the behavior look like. We will address this question it will lead to something called anomalous diffusion which of some practical importance we will address this question. Hmm. The other direction in which we can move is to say let us go back and look at first passage times namely the probability of hitting a particular point or a set of boundary points and ask what is the distribution of the first passage look like what does the mean first passage time look like and so on because that is an a complementary way of looking at diffusion itself. Now, the main lesson we learned from ordinary diffusion was that the variance of the displacement goes like time linearly in the time that was our main lesson that was diffusive behavior to start with. We could ask the complementary question we say all right you are saying that the mean square displacement let us call it r squared assuming we start from the origin till time t goes like t to the power 1 that was the main lesson 
here. So, in a given time, the mean square displacement is proportional to that time. Okay. We could ask given a distance, what is the mean time to reach that distance for the first time? That is the first passage time problem. So, here the random variable in this is the position. You are giving me a certain interval of time and saying how far are you gone on the average in this. Now, I could ask the other question. I could say I give you a certain interval of time and how far did you go was answered by this. Now, I ask I give you a certain distance to, to be traversed and ask how long will it take for the first time to get there. That is the mean first passage time problem. <laughs> so, let us do that in the case of a very simple problem namely a one dimensional random walk on a linear lattice and see what this first passage time looks like because it will tell us a general way of looking at this problem in full. And that also will tell us how to characterize random walks on objects like fractals which is one of the things I would like to talk about. Okay. So, let us play this game for a while and see what general lessons we can get from it. So, I start with uh, a linear lattice in this fashion and this is the site 0, this is minus 1, this is 1, this is site 2, this is site minus 2 etcetera. I am interested in distances, so let us keep it completely symmetrical and there is a certain site here which is j. This is a minus j and it keeps going, but I put a barrier here, a barrier here at this j. And the question I want to ask is, I start from the origin, what is the mean time to hit the point plus or minus j, a distance j away from the origin for the first time. But before that, we already know that if I say this is a random walk in which I take a step at, at each time step, I take a step to the right or left, then we already know this that the mean distance that you reach in a certain time n is equal to n because the average value of j is 0, it is an unbiased walk. Therefore, the mean square displacement j squared is n. This we know already. Now, I want to ask what is the mean time to reach plus or minus j for the first time that is the question I want to ask. So, I imagine putting two barriers at plus or minus j and or detectors and the moment the particle hits either plus j or minus j I declare the end process is over. And then I start with another particle at the origin and go through it once again and calculate what the time is and take the arithmetic average of all these things that is the mean time. So, that is the problem we want to look at. Now, I know that this process is Markov and it is happening in discrete time. So, let us call T k to be the mean time to hit the point plus or minus j for the first time starting from the lattice point k and k runs from minus j to plus j. Okay. What are the properties that you can think of for this? So, these are all mean first passage time problems. So, is the question clear? I start from a site k, some arbitrary site k which is running between minus j and plus j and I ask what is the mean time to hit either plus j or minus j. Okay. This is what I would like to answer to start with. Right. Now, we can do this in a number of ways, but the simplest way to do it is to exploit the Markov property at all. Okay. So, I start by saying the following T naught is the mean time to hit plus or minus j for the first time. I am going to ign I am going to suppress all those indices. I should really write T k 
plus or minus j to show that you are hitting plus or minus j starting from the side j etcetera, but let us omit that it is understood. So, t naught is the mean time to start at 0 at t equal to 0 in discrete time and ask what is the mean time to hit this point or that point for the first time. Okay. It is clear that I cannot hit that point without crossing the point plus 1 or minus 1. And in the first time step with probability half I hit either 1 or minus 1. Right? So, add up probabilities. So, this must be equal to 1 half times going to the point 1 and then the mean time to go from 1 to plus or minus j and that is t 1. So, this must be equal to 1 half times t 1 but I used up a time step in doing so. So, I add a 1 okay. plus there was the possibility of going to minus 1. So, probability was 1 t minus 1 plus 1 and I have used the Markov property in writing this additive property of the means. Okay. Is there any other possibility? Because at the end of a time step it has to be either at plus 1 or minus 1. You are not allowing for it to stay there that is it. right? So, these are the only two possibilities. right? But you have exchanged one unknown for other unknowns. So, we have to write down what is T 1. So, I am here at this point and then what happens? With probability half I come to T 0, with probability half I go to T 2. right? So, this must be equal to 1 half T naught plus 1 plus 1 half T 2 plus 1. And I have to write the equation for all these fellows and all these fellows. And there is a set of coupled equations which I have to solve in principle. Hmm? But some general things are emerging already. What happens once I hit Tj minus 1? What is the equation satisfied by Tj minus 1? With probability half, I am at t j minus 2, I, I hit j minus 2, right? I, I jump to the left. Having come here, I am going back and forth, so I could have come here, right? So, this is equal to half t j minus 2 plus 1, but with probability half, I could have jumped there to that point, and then the walk is over, right? So, it is plus 1 half t j plus 1. But what is t sub j? Yeah, it is 0 because it is the mean time to start at j and go to j. I am already there and the walk is over, right? So, t j is 0, therefore, you end up with. Right? Similarly, on this side, and we have to now solve this equation the set of uh, recursion relations has to be solved. But there are certain obvious symmetries in this problem. Hmm? Would you say that if it is a walk is unbiased, would you say that t 1 is equal to t minus 1? Yeah, there is nothing to distinguish between right and left. This one is closer to that guy by 1, but it is further from here by 1, but this fellow is just reversed. Remember the boundaries are placed symmetrically about the origin. Right? So, it is clear that you have a general rule which says in this case t k equal to t minus k. Hmm? So, this uh, thing can only be an even function of k because t k must be equal to t minus k. Hmm? Now, let us examine this fellow here a little bit. This guy says that <coughs> 1 half t 1 plus t minus 1 minus t naught equal to minus 1. 
I keep this on this side, I keep this on this side, I bring this T naught here and move the constant together. So, is equal to that, right? And so on. Each time I have this uh, thing here. Now, this is the arithmetic mean of the two neighbors with a half and then a minus 1 as a coefficient. If I pull out this half, what happens? It is T1 plus T minus 1 minus twice T naught. What sort of difference is that? It says f of x minus epsilon plus f of x plus epsilon minus twice f of x. Second difference, second difference, right? And the second difference is a constant. So, when the second difference is a constant, what kind of function can it be of the variable? Quadratic. It has got to be a quadratic function, right? So, we already know that this tk must be a quadratic function of k. Hmm? So, let us write uh, tk equal to some uh, uh, constant plus bk plus c k squared, but this is 0, b equal to 0 because of this property. Right? So, it has got to be of this form a plus c k squared. Hmm? Right? What is the boundary condition on this t k? t j equal to 0. Must be true, right? So, it says a plus c j squared equal to 0. So, this becomes equal to c times k squared minus j squared. Okay. All it leaves us, so, so that satisfies the boundary condition, hmm. and all it leaves us is to find this value of the c constant z c. Okay. What is t0? If I put k equal to 0, I end up with minus cj squared, but it cannot be negative. The mean time to go from the origin to this point cannot be negative. Right? So, it means c must be negative as I have written it there. Right? So, it must be of the form minus c times j squared minus k squared. And it must be independent of j. This guy cannot depend on j. So, you can use any simple model to find what j is, right, uh, to find what c is, the constant c is. How do you do this? What would you do? Pardon me? Pardon me? T0, yeah. T0, and take j plus minus 1. Yeah, so all you have to do is to take plus minus 1, take any particular point and it will tell you the value of c immediately. I leave you to work this out. c it turned out to be minus 1. Okay. So, that is very straightforward to establish. Minus 1. So, it says t k, it is a simple exercise to show that this is equal to j squared minus k squared. So, it says the mean time to hit the point plus or minus j 
from the origin. So, the mean time t to hit the point plus or minus j starting from the origin this mean time is equal to j squared. You see it is the perfect complement of this it is the perfect complement of this guy because it says the mean for a given uh, the mean distance squared hmm, mean square displacement is proportional to the time and it is here it says that you give me the distance and the mean time is the square of that distance it is exactly the complement of it. So, you can define the diffusion constant in this manner we defined it earlier as saying the limit of x squared average divided by 2 t was equal to d capital D. You can define it the other way you can define it as the limit of in terms of the time you can define the mean time to go a certain distance and in this case in the discrete case to the continuum case the normalization is this 2 d twice the diffusion constant. So, this is an equally convenient way of finding the diffusion constant and of retaining the basic property of diffusion namely that the square of the distance goes like the time. Okay. In this case the time is a random variable the distance is fixed. So, now we generalize this we generalize this for all sorts of structures. So, I would start by saying I forget about putting these averages and so on. So, I say that r squared there are suitable averages depending on whether you want doing this or that this goes like asymptotically like t if it is normal diffusion, hmm. but otherwise it goes like 2 divided by d walk. So, I introduce a dimensionality called the random walk dimension. on any structure and I will explain what the rationale in doing this is as we will see this very shortly. So, I introduce this dimensionality we need to compute what it is it says the mean square distance goes like t to this power or the time mean time goes like in for a given distance like in this fashion here. For normal diffusion this is 2 because r squared goes like t in this sense or this sense ok. We will see that on fractal structures and so on this d w is different from 2 we will see precisely what this implies here. So, let us do this in several steps first let us solve the problem of this first passage time on other lattices we did this for linear lattice let us see whether this gives us some general hints as to what to do and how to do this at all. Suppose we did this on a square lattice for instance. So, you have this kind of thing etcetera and there is some boundary and I want to compute what is the time mean time to start from here and do a random walk with equal probability of going to each of its nearest neighbors and hitting this boundary point I need the mean time for instance. So, if this point is t naught or let us call this point uh, the central point t naught example and I have nearest neighbors and I assume nearest neighbor jumps always let us call this a b c d for example. The mean time to go from these points would be t a t b t c t d to this boundary they would be equal if the boundary is also symmetric has the same square symmetry that this lattice has, but if it does not it is not symmetric it does not matter does not matter in any case, no? but the moment I write an equation down for t naught you write see that t naught is equal to from here in the first step you go here, here, here or here with equal probability and what is that probability 1 quarter. So, you are going to write this as 1 quarter t a plus t b plus t c plus t d plus 1 because in each case you are going to add a 1 for the first step and 1 4 times 4 is equal to 1 in this fashion, but I can rewrite this and then there is a whole set of equations, but I can rewrite this as 1 quarter T A plus T B plus T C plus T D minus T naught is equal to minus 1 and what is this fellow here on the left 
earlier it was one half times the second difference. Huh? Now what is this thing? What is this this thing here? It is not the second difference, it is a very definite quantity. It says one quarter is the coordination number of this lattice, there are four nearest neighbors, right? And you are taking this, this you are summing this over all the nearest neighbors and subtracting this quantity here. This is the mean value of these four guys. It is the mean value, there are four of them and you take one fourth, it is the mean value, right? So, what is this object? You take the mean value at any point minus T naught, what is that quantity? It is the discrete Laplacian, it is the Laplacian on a graph, right? So, you are really writing the Laplacian and you see the del squared coming out here. So, it is a discrete Laplacian here. In every case, it will be the discrete Laplacian. So, what will the general case be if you got an arbitrary lattice with all kinds of coordination numbers? What you would have is the following. You would have a delta ij tj, this quantity, equal to minus 1, where I have to define what this fellow is. This guy here, for a given site i, there are these nearest neighbors. These are all the set, this set of nearest neighbor, this set of quantity, this guy here, these are the nearest neighbors j, right? And what you have, this quantity here is 1 over the coordination number of i, because with equal probability you jump to all these other neighbors and let us call that nu sub i, 4 if you have 4 nearest neighbors, 6 if you have 6 nearest neighbors, etc., etc., 1 over nu i times a Kronecker delta here provided i and j are nearest neighbors. This symbol stands for nearest neighbors. It is equal to 1 if i and j are nearest neighbors, 0 otherwise. Plus 1 if i, j are nearest neighbors, 0 if not. Okay. Minus delta i j itself, that is this quantity minus t naught whatever. So that is what the discrete Laplacian is, weighted discrete Laplacian, weighted with this coordination number. Okay. And it says delta ij tj equal to minus 1 for every site. And at the boundary sites, the tj's are 0, whatever be the boundary sites. Okay. So that is the equation you got to solve in very compact form. Now, what does this finally imply? It implies that the solution for all the Tj's is just the matrix inverse of this, the inverse of this matrix. Once you find the inverse of this matrix over the full lattice, the matter is over. That is it. Hmm? And that is what we did for the linear lattice. We did that by a clever trick by observing that this has got to be a quadratic function and so on. But in the more general case, it is much harder to do. But you really say finally reduce this to an inversion of a matrix. But if your structure has n lattice points, then this matrix is of order n squared and it is a non-trivial point. You, you really need some symmetries in the problem to solve it. But in principle, it is done. Now, where did this whole thing come from? It came from the following fact. It is a special case of a more general relation and that is the following. Suppose I look at the diffusion problem on this lattice and instead of looking at the probability density at a particular point, I look at the first passage time as a function of time to go from the site j to some specified set of boundary points or traps when the walk ends. Okay. Let us call that distribution in time f j or of t. It means it is the time f j of t is the probability density function in time that starting from the site j you are going to hit 
any of these boundary points for the first time in a time interval between t and t plus t t. That is what this thing means here. Then it satisfies because this finally is reduced like in the earlier case we saw what the problem reduced to. It reduces to solutions of the diffusion equation of some kind right and the discrete diffusion equation would look like this delta i j on this side would be equal to the diffusion equation. So, what, what appears on the right hand side? This is summed over j. So, what would appear on the right hand side? It would be delta f i of t over delta t because it's i is a free index. That is the diffusion equation on a lattice. Yes, okay. And that is f j is the first, first passage time density. Hmm? What is the mean first passage time? The integral of this f multiplied by t, right. So, to go from t j that is what the mean first passage time was. But really I need not use the mean, I could use the mean square, mean cube, mean any higher moments etcetera. Let us call the qth moment. This is the qth <laughs> moment of the mean of the first passage time to go from j to whatever boundary points you want for the first time. Okay. What is the definition of this guy? This is equal to an integral from 0 to infinity d t t to the power q delta f j over delta t oh, sorry f j of t. That is the first passage time density. This is the qth moment of the first passage time density. What is the zeroth moment of this first passage time density? It is equal to 1 if and only if first passage to that point is a sure event, then it is normalized to unity. Otherwise, it is not even a sure event, right. So, we first have to make sure that given enough time, the system, the particle will hit those boundary points. In other words, we have got to make sure the walk is recurrent and so on. That is a separate story altogether. On finite lattices, it will always happen because it is a Markov chain with finite number of sites, no traps, it will hit it given enough time. Okay. So, that is a point which we have to worry about in the infinite media, we will come to that separately. But you agree that this is the notation is that starting from the point j to hit any traps or whatever for the first time the qth moment of the mean time is uh, of the time is this quantity here. So, let us take this equation and multiply by t to the q and integrate over t on both sides. Then I stay this multiplied by t to the power q and I do an integral over dt from 0 to infinity. This is spatial indices. So, I pull that out and I get this relation which says delta i j and what is inside is t to the q f this is t j q. the qth moment okay. and that is equal to on the right hand side integral 0 to infinity dt t to the q delta f j uh, I should be careful about notation f i by delta t. I can do this integration by parts out here and then what does the first term give? So, this thing here is equal to t to the q f i of t from t equal to 0 to infinity minus q times integral 0 to infinity d t t to the q minus 1 f i of t 
by integrating by parts. Now, this is the solution to the diffusion equation all moments of this quantity are finite implies that this goes to 0 faster than any power of t as t tends to infinity okay. and is finite at the origin. So, this guy here is 0 this boundary term is 0. So, we finally end up with an equation which says delta i j t j of q is equal to minus q t q minus 1 i. q is greater than equal to 1. So, that is the general relation. By the way, this equation is called the backward Kolmogorov equation. I have not explicitly introduced it for continuous uh, diffusive processes, but that is what it is. We did this on a lattice and I motivated it by showing you what happens on a linear lattice and then simple generalizations of it. What happens to that equation if you put q equal to 1? It says delta i j t j we call this the mean time the mean first passage time itself was equal to minus 1 because this fellow t 0 is 1 okay. that is exactly what we got earlier. We found the discrete Laplacian acting on this set of mean first passage times gives you minus 1 on the right hand side, but that is a special case which follows from the backward Kolmogorov equation. And you see now even without solving for this you can find all the moments because you solve this set of equations you find all the tj's you put that in there and then you get the second moment of all the first passage times put that on the right hand side and you get the third and so on in principle. Okay. So, now I need to explain to you what is meant by this walk dimension and what happens on lattices which are not regular lattices. So, once again we will take recourse to the simple linear lattice see what happens and then simple ordinary two, the two dimensional lattices and then from there we will exploit this relationship we will exploit this thing over and over again to see how to solve this problem on hierarchical structures okay. But I hope the logic is clear it follows from the diffusion equation finally it is just that on the discrete case it is a little easier to exhibit things explicitly like we saw for the linear lattice rather than write those messy Levy distributions and so on in the continuum case. We can always go to the continuum, but I think that the discrete case explains it much more clearly here. Okay. I do not know what uh, I do not know what word you use for this thing here uh, I, for this uh, this object here. Uh, must have some special name in electrical engineering because in a circuit this is exactly what you do you look you connect up various things with resistors and then you uh, I mean this is the adjacency matrix of this graph and so on and so forth. Right? But we have not made any specific assumptions about which points it jumps to and so on I have just said for nearest neighbor jumps this is what it is, but you can solve this problem even if you had longer jumps and, and so on so you can see. <coughs> But uh, to my mind this is the simplest way of understanding this uh, first passage time the behavior of this first passage time because as I have shown uh, rather than looking at the distribution in position for a given structure it is easier to look at the distribution in time and ask how long does it take to go twice as far thrice as far etc. Okay. So, next time we will see the explicit uh, meaning of what this walk dimensionality is and so on and how it is equal to 2 for regular structures, but for anomalous structures like fractals it changes it need not be an integer ok. So, we will do that next time tomorrow.